I'll just uh, start it up. All right. We're at Black Buffalo 3D in New Jersey again, and they've got a print going on right now behind me. It's an experimental print with some material they're testing. Like we said, this is a pretty new printer for them. It's been here a few months, and so they're still figuring out which materials they want to start doing some of their bigger projects with. That way they can move forward efficiently. I'm here today with their CEO, Michael Woods, and he's going to tell you a little bit about their project, the company, the vision, and what they're moving forward with next. So I'll help the questions you have in the chat. I'll ask directly to Michael, and maybe he'll be able to answer some of these for you. So without further ado, let's check out this print in here from Michael. Got you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. It's a hot day here in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and we're doing a nice experimental print. What we're doing here is we're just, um, we're not doing a print for anything specific. We're just printing a nice, long, easy line, getting a few turns on this so that we can see how the cement works. We're working with actually a cement mixture that we have used before uh, and we already know that it's a little bit too heavy in its aggregate or its sand percentage and the whole thing about 3d printing is the percentage of the portland uh, the aggregate which is the sand and then there's some fibers in it as well currently we're using polypropylene fibers we're really excited about uh, incorporating hemp fibers in the future um, as that uh, industry starts to get a lot more mature so what you see here is the printer moving at a pretty good clip. We just put down some Durawall, uh, and that's the vertical, um, or pardon me, the horizontal rebar that we use. And I think the whole industry now uses this uh, Durawall. It's a much better way than actually printing, um, you know, a triangle in between the two walls for strength. It gives us that really good strength. Uh, you can see that we, on the bottom here, snags. And that's what this is all about. This is all about experimentation. And, you know, we're just printing, paying for this on our own. This is nothing that we're doing for a client. We just really are testing to make sure that what is the right um, ad mixture, what is the right consistency, what's the right flow speed, both on the nozzle as well as on the pump, right? And so we don't really use our whole silo in test pumps like this. We usually go through two or three uh, super sacks uh, a day, a thousand pounds. A material per sack. So we usually do something around two to 3,000 pounds a day when we're experimenting with a certain mixture just to make sure. Then this mixture and, the, and a part of this wall will go to a laboratory. And then that laboratory will test it for shrinkage uh, for seven days, compression, many other tests that, uh, for seismic, you know, uh, the vapor, you know, fire, water, uh, everything will be tested. It's roughly like 18, 19 different tests. Uh, that we do. So there's there's a lot of activity that goes back and forth from something this simple and this quick, right? We're printing this wall. We've only been printing right now for about an hour, right? That's about it. So you can see how quick this printer really moves. And we've had a couple stops in that hour as well uh, with the printer, you know, to, to re-engage. Sometimes if it's too sandy, right, it'll actually clog up the pump. We got to stop the pump. You can keep going with the printer. Right, but you're, you're watching how much is in that head uh, gasket above the printer, and then the, the, pr the, the pump will get cleaned out real quick, go again, and start going in with the tube. Right, so uh, it's a really uh, th these days are most fun for us because we don't know what we're going to get <laughs> when we start the day. Because we got a new mixture, we got uh, we're finding out how it works with the pump and the flow, we're finding out how it comes out with the um, uh, with the printer head. You know, just like this, we had to have a quick stop. Right. And now we're going to move and you know, change things around a little bit. Start stop function a little. Pardon me? Start stop. Yeah, function. sure. So on the stop uh, and the start, essentially what you're doing when you stop, um, if the line ended here and you bring the printer head out like we are right now, we're bringing it out to you know, clean out the pump or to you know, uh, clean out the head uh, of the printer nozzle. Right? So that would just come straight out. We clean everything out. And then with the G-code, uh, which is right there. Um, our G code is what we programmed in terms of uh, making sure that this is what we're actually printing, right? So that G code will just be put right back. Uh, it will take the head right back to where it ended, and then it just starts spraying right down again, and it just keeps going, right? So start it, starting and stopping is actually quite easy. Um, and as well, 
let's say it started raining today. There's not a cloud in the sky, uh, but let's say it did start raining and we stopped for the day. Then we would stop today, we'd clean out the, the pump, we clean out the tubes, and then tomorrow we come right back and we just start printing right at that space again. Uh, clean it up, get it ready to go, and just, just continue. So the starting and the stopping is really, really simple um, on this side. How long do you completely stay stopped without having to do a full flush? Uh, you can stay um, stopped for about 72 hours. Um, so you can stop for quite some time. After 72 hours, you've got to put uh, a bonding agent um, on top of the last layer that you did to ensure that the layers of uh, concrete adhere to each other properly. But you've got a good 72 hours of safety margin you know, in between a print, just in case you had bad weather for a couple days. But how long before the concrete box the hose and it's left in the hose? Oh, for that time? Usually about uh, 20 minutes, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. So you've got plenty of time to kind of go through. But if we think that it's going to be um, a longer issue to repair, right, then we're just going to pump everything through the hose. And you can see here, this is all we basically have for, um, you know, trash for the day, right? The, the problem with so many construction sites is the amount of garbage, the amount of, you know, refuge that you're putting out on a daily basis, the pieces of metal, the pieces of wood, et cetera, the extra pieces of cement from us starting you know, getting the flow going out of the printer from the beginning of the day. And then anytime we start and stop and we're, we're, we're recycling out something, we pour it all into these trash cans. And that's all you're getting for garbage for the whole day. So in terms of eliminating so much of the, you know, the, the, the trash that's coming out of all of these different garbage sites, you know, you're eliminating maybe 95 to 98 percent of that, which is such a great deal for the environment. Um, such a wonderful thing in terms of, you know, not a, over wasting material because material costs are so high as it is already, you really bring down that material cost uh, overall by saving on the, uh, on the disposal. What's the origin story of Black Buffalo? Sure, so the origin of Black Buffalo, this is uh, a company that we actually acquired uh, in Korea with our parent, uh, HN Inc. Um, and we acquired this company about four years ago. Can't make it up, the name of the company was actually called Corona Design Services. So obviously it's not called that any longer. Uh, and we renamed it to Hisis. So Hisis is our sister company in Korea where we have a factory just like here and we build our printers there and we coordinate all the um, R&D for both material science and mechanical engineering. So we actually are the first company to be a truly global 3D printing company to be able to not only uh, have the same material on different continents, but also have two manufacturing facilities so that as we're selling these printers, we're able to grow them quickly towards the clients that want them. So if we're going to the Middle East uh, for people that want printers, we're shipping from Korea. We're going to Canada, US or LATAM, and we're, we're building them and shipping them from here. So it really gives us a great advantage in terms of not just time to market, but also cost of delivery. What is someone who wants a printer? Where do they go? Your website, email? Yeah, good question. So we are uh, the one Mac Daddy that you see here. Uh, this goes up 53 feet. Uh, this is our largest uh, printer, actually the largest printer in the world. Uh, we just finished uh, this summer. We finished all of the design for what we call our NC1G, Next Generation Construction Machine. And that machine now will be available in this fall. It's gonna be going up about 29 feet in terms of print. So it can be two stories high for 10 feet or three stories high for nine feet high walls. Those will be available uh, come this fall. We're building th our first three simultaneously in Korea. And then first quarter, we're procuring all of our materials here in the US with different manufacturing steel uh, partners for all of the fabrication that we have to do. And all of those will start being built here by end of Q4 to the beginning of Q1. So we'll have production going on on both continents. And if it, anybody wants to uh, look, just go right to blackbuffalo.io. You've got a section there for uh, contacting us. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. What's the next six months look like for Black Buffalo and then the next three years and then the next 10 years? Yeah, the next six months are really busy. We're finishing up, as I mentioned, the NC1G, the first commercial unit uh, for sale and lease. Uh, throughout the globe. Those will be here within the next two to three months uh, and available uh, globally. Uh, after that, we're redesigning a, or designing a new uh, printer, which will actually be one story high or three meters high. That will come out, we think, by the summer of next year. And then we're looking also for the NC2G. Our next one will be out in 2023. 
our goal here at Black Buffalo, if you look at the longer term, we feel that these 3D printers are indispensable on construction sites for so many reasons. Faster construction, um, um, much less expensive in terms of building the, uh, the, 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 the walls and the structures, um, no waste uh, to, to really speak of compared to today. As well, it's all recyclable material. So it's um, very sustainable. So what we would love to see is that on every site of construction, either residential, commercial, infrastructure, doesn't matter, whether it's building the walls or also doing the precast for the ground or any of the, of the waterworks or uh, anything else that's underground or above ground in terms of infrastructure. You can 3D print it because it's concrete now, right? You can do it faster on site. You can drop it right in. You have no transport uh, cost, services, and time. So our goal, our dream, is that every construction site has one of these 3D printers on it, and it just becomes another tractor, another forklift, another crane that's right there doing real-time, on-the-spot production of walls and utilities that you need to be able to complete your job. People are asking how much the printers cost. I know there's a lot of variance in the models you offer, shipping costs and options people might ask, but is there a big range you provide? Sure. So we think um, we're, as we're building them now, the unfortunate thing is everything's so much more expensive. You know, wood's three, four times it was two, three years ago. Steel's doubled and more this year. All right. So we think these are going to go somewhere between seven and 800,000 uh, for the two-story high, which we think is a, quite a bargain. Our one-story high is probably going to be about two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand, right? And then above above that, this one's not for sale. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're not really selling our our Big Mac Daddy because we'll be using this one on site for all of our precast jobs uh, that people are asking us to do right now. So for us, the activity is just really quite good. Precast, different pilot projects, other projects lined up as the printer gets here, and candidly, there's just so much demand uh, that we're seeing for our printers that we just can't keep up. Uh, we can't build them fast enough to the demand that's coming to us. If somebody sees the technology, loves the technology, wants to buy a 3D printed object, is there a particular object or catalog of objects you'd recommend or nice to get 3D printed? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I haven't thought about that one. Uh, I would think that uh, some of the objects that we give out, when we do short lines, we do like five or six different lines of something. The really neat thing is when you crack that open, you can actually see on the inside the bonding that happens. You can see here, you see each one of the lines, right? And you would think that, okay, the inside might look the same, but the inside actually is just one, actually looks like your hand, it's just one clear straight strip of bonding of all of that concrete. So what we do a lot of times is we'll take, you know, the small test prints, we'll crack them and we'll give them out for paperweights. People love to just take this to their office and have it on their credenza or whatever it may be to see the difference between the outside and the inside and really see how that compression really comes uh, together for the concrete. But maybe um, some of the smaller things, you know, maybe, um, you know, I don't know, maybe a garden, a garden box, right? To be able to, uh, a pot for different trees or different flowers or vegetables, whatever it may be, that might be something in the future. But the bulk of what we do are large scale, um, large scale printing. So we don't really sell pieces uh, too much. Do you want to, kind of show the system to the printer and describe the, from the pump and the mixer to Sure, process. sure, yeah. So the pump right now, um, we're just doing a, a quick test run. So you can see here that we just have one super sack over the top of our pump. Usually if you come back this way, if we're doing a full day, we're doing a full day print, you're gonna be in that hopper. You're gonna be in that silo with about five different super sacks. Actually, our new silo is going to be multiples of that to be able to hold so we can actually, um, you know, go through about 30 super sacks a day um, is our goal, which would just be amazing. You get so much done uh, in that time. Uh, you can see over here on the right side, that's where we're controlling the path of the printer and you're communicating there. If we were using the silo, you'd be communicating back and forth to the silo, the pump and the water um, exchange in terms of speeding up, slowing down when it gets more watery, less watery, et cetera. Um, so it, 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 you've got a smart device that goes back and forth. And that's one of the things that we're also experimenting on right now is smart technology on the printer so that your sensors are really uh, finding out what's the humidity, um, what's the heat, uh, what kind of dew point. Um, that helps with the consistency of the concrete coming out of the, 
out, out of the pump into the nozzle. And then of course the speed of the nozzle based on that consistency um, of the, uh, of the admixture. Yep. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's the, that's the bulk of it. It's Wanna really go around and check out the house. Yeah, sure. We could do that. Let's go around and uh, take a look here too. Sure. Yeah. So some of the things that we printed in the past, we get a lot of questions on rebar. So how do you do rebar? You all saw already how we do um, the Dura wall, but we can also do, you know, vertical rebar where after you're done with a wall, depending on the size, if you're doing nine foot or 10 foot or whatever it may be, then you're putting the Dura wall in and then filling with, uh, with uh, ready mix uh, into the middle of this. Uh, we can do two walls together, uh, either six inches wide or eight inches wide, which is pretty standard uh, for construction. And then the middle of it is where you see that Dura wall that we did, the horizontal, you put your vertical in and also you do your utilities through there. So you do your water pipes through there. You do all of your, um, you know, your fibers and your wiber, wires and everything else for the factory or for the house or for the industrial building, whatever it may be. Um, we also experiment a lot on curves. So this is one of the coolest um, type of changes that can happen to the construction industry is you can now curve a wall. I mean, simply, easily. And you know how hard it is, is if everyone's, anyone's ever at their house tried to do a dome at your house, it takes forever, right, for the framing crew. You know, this, this takes us less than a day <laughs> to do this. So it's so much faster to do really nice designs that architecturally, on a traditional basis of building, um, you know, structures and frames, just isn't possible to do this well, this quick, this fast. Um, this we just put on just to move it around. Uh, but we think it's kind of a cool look for a barn. All right, uh, to build a barn like this, and then you have a roof uh, that you can put on top. So that's the, uh, that's the look of that. Why don't we look at the tiny house as well? So we did a small experiment for the tiny house. You know, I really should figure out a way to not have a white shirt when we're printing concrete, right? Uh, I don't know why we ordered white polos. We should order black polos or gray polos um, as well. Uh, but come on this way. Watch your head. So here's our tiny house uh, that we built. Just a quick experiment um, for us. So essentially just uh, you know, a small little uh, 200 and some square foot um, home. Um, took us, you know, uh, we did multiple different layers, multiple different experiments. You can see here, you can see the difference in the colors, right? And that mix there versus that mix there versus that mix, right? So. We, we just like to, as we're experimenting with the mixture flow, as we're doing today, we don't want to just do it and then trash it. We like to actually do it in some kind of configuration that we can show people the, the capabilities of the printer. So we printed this over a few days, just experimenting with mixture after mixture after mixture. It's nothing that we'd put a person in, but it's perfect for us in terms of uh, R&D. Uh, so you'll see that here you would have, if we just spread this out and made it larger, this would be your living room, your kitchen over here, right? Your entry door. And then right here is your bathroom and your shower. And you can see a window is real easy for us to do. Um, the window is really simple. You're just going to have a header over it. And then you just put this on that kind of like we lay the durable. You're just laying that on the uh, space. The printer for each one of these lines essentially just stops printing, moves over to here, starts printing again, goes over all the way around, stops printing, moves over here, starts printing again. Really simple, quick and easy uh, for this. And what I was talking about earlier, if you can get your printer up here, or your uh, up here, you can see this here, we cut this so people can see how it all bonds together. To me, that's kind of the coolest part of this tech on the material science, is that on the outside, it, it's all layered, but on the inside, it's all consistent in terms of the bonding nature of it. Doing yeah, now. yeah, we're, we're, you caught us right towards the end, buddy. So you, you, you got a good timing. Um, so we're, we're just cleaning up now, finishing up our test run today of two super sacks. Uh, so about 2,000 pounds of material uh, to be able to uh, test this. Again, we knew that this had too much sand in it. So essentially, we're getting rid of old material that we know that doesn't really work uh, and just testing a configuration of a wall, um, you know, for future use and future design purposes. So really a productive day today. Really fun. 
um, our whole team is um, cleaning up, um, having a good time. Uh, and then we're going to get lunch here in about, about an hour. What were the issues with the material that you want to use? Try a different material next time. So we changed the consistency between the, the aggregate, the sand, and then also the portland cement, right? Or, um, so um, those two uh, are really your baselines of making any kind of mortar type admixture. Then, of course, you have some different um, additive mixtures in it, which I can't really go to because uh, that's kind of our proprietary mix. And then you have the fibers. And the fibers is what really pulls it together. What we're noticing, uh, for anybody that knows concrete, most of your, your concrete cures over time, right? Uh, if you all remember, uh, uh, Santorini clay was really the baseline for a lot of the things that were built, you know, such as the Parthenon and others in, um, in Greece, in Italy, et cetera. That concrete would cure for years and never really uh, get its full strength for years. Now, with today's technology, most of your concrete actually cures to about 95 to plus percent of its compressive strength in roughly 28 days. That's kind of the secret number, 28-ish days. What we're finding with our admixture, because when we get it right, and we work with a partner, MAPE, uh, one of the largest um, concrete producers and distributors here in the United States, we're working with them and their R&D department. So we also have a third party going through all of our findings. So you know we're not conflicted at all by anything we're doing. We have a, a very good professional outside expert looking through this as well. So what we're finding with our concrete with MAPE is the way that we're creating it, that 28 day compressive strength, which is industry norm, we're getting that same compressive 28 day strength in four days. I mean, it's pretty incredible. We can dial it up, we can dial it down based on the amount of concrete versus sand, et cetera. So when we're going to different temperatures, different parts of the world, and we need something to be stronger because of seismic activity, we need something to be thinner because it's hotter, right? Or we need something to be, have a higher R factor for insulation because it's colder. That's what all of this R&D is for, is to know which mixture we need when we get a request for a printer or a project in a certain part of the world. Have you experimented with any overhangs? Not yet. No, nope, we have not. Um, would you prefer to 3D print in a facility or on location? Um, it depends on the job. If it's, um, if it's a um, job that's multiple houses, such as affordable housing, we prefer to do it on location. If it's a large commercial uh, building, right, where you're, you're doing a 200,000 square foot distribution uh, building, then we prefer also to do that on spot. Actually, that's the smartest thing to do on spot because you're printing everything. Just think about printing all of your 3D panels, your concrete panels, to put up around your metal structure for that distribution, warehouse, factory, whatever it may be. And while you're digging out right, and getting all your fill and putting in all of your underlying uh, infrastructure, you're printing all that infrastructure right, here, right there, right now. Then you're just taking your crane, just like you would if they were delivered on a low boy truck. Right? You're taking your crane, you're just putting it in the ground, or you're taking your wall and you're notching it together. So most of what we want to do is on location, except for some precast uh, jobs where we're, built, we're, we're precasting multiple units of something that somebody's taking somewhere else. Uh, we'd love to do customized printers built at precast shops, and then we do the precast here on site as well. So can you run through like a checklist of what the cleanup process looks like? Yeah, sure. So the cleanup process is number one, you're cleaning the pump um, and you're, you're really washing that out. You're taking the comp uh, it apart component by component and just making sure that you're getting all of the cement gunk out of there, the liquid, so it doesn't harden. Um, right. So you really have to do a good job, you know, um, at the end of the day and also in the middle of the day of a pump, because that's a lot of aggregate going through that pump. Right. It's it's really coarse. So we actually stop when we're printing for a full day. We usually stop once, maybe twice just to have a quick um, blowout of everything, clean it all up and start printing again, which takes about a half an hour, not that big a deal. Then at the end of the day, we're blowing out the hoses. So you have no more aggregate in the holes that can harden. And then the next day when you come, you can't get through that hose because all of a sudden you got concrete in the hose, right? So we uh, um, blow that out and we blow it out into those uh, just trash cans. And that's, again, that's the total amount of garbage that we have for the day. Right? And that's it. I mean, it's pretty easy in terms of cleaning up. Then, of course, you're taking all your equipment inside at the end of the day and you're cleaning up the site at the end of the day, normal stuff. 
uh, trying to make sure just in case it rains overnight, nothing's out here, everything goes back into the factory or over a cover of a tent or something. Is there anything you could share about plans for electrical systems, uh, HVAC, plumbing? Yeah, so for us, um, HVAC plumbing um, in our side really uh, is applicable at the design of the building. So if somebody has more HVAC or plumbing needs that they might have in a larger, let's say, a distribution center or commercial building for an office, uh, et cetera, all of that can be programmed for the mechanical design. So we get the mechanical blueprints and you'll, you'll tell us where, where that HVAC is coming in, where it's coming out, right? Where is all that plumbing coming in and where are the tubes going? We can actually program just like a, just like a, a, a window in a wall or a door, we can actually program that hole. So your lines can come in and lines can come out. It's not, not a problem. It's just part of the G code. Uh, just like if you were designing a Lego, right? You'd leave a hole and you just do your Legos up there. So it's uh, basically the same. In terms of uh, electrical for us on our side, uh, we're fully um, electric. We're not using any gas uh, or petroleum in any way. So we're, we're trying to do this as green as possible. Uh, and for us, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned earlier, what we're very excited about is to make this a much smarter uh, printer, a much smarter robot, because that's really what this is. This is a robot technology. So as we start to add not just sensors for weather uh, conditions, we're also putting sensors and radar up on the top of the x-axis. So if I fall down, uh, that proximity uh, and motion actually sees you falling down and stops the machine. If this machine got too close to a piece of equipment, right, so that it doesn't hit something, right, you have a proximity alert and it'll actually stop before it hits. So there's a lot of safety protocols as well that we're experimenting with so that when we put these out there in the field, right, it just runs autonomously uh, and it also runs safely uh, for, the, uh, for the security of all the workers and also the guests that come to see it. Because we get a lot of guests uh, that come to see this. They just want to see it. They want to touch it. They want to feel it because this is futuristic in some people's minds. But to be quite honest, the time is now. There's so many great companies out there that are doing so many great things. The Icons, the Apis Cores, uh, the Wind Suns in China, uh, the Cobods uh, in Europe. There's so many great companies that are doing great things and we're so happy for them because remember, the construction industry is the number one sector contributor to global GNP. It's roughly 14% of global GNP. It's a monster. I think there's enough business for everybody. It's also the highest employer. It's almost 8% of all employable human beings throughout the globe. So this potential that all of us have in this industry is just so tremendous to make life better, give people better places to live, give people that have no place, have no home to live and can't afford it. Now they can and we can get them done quickly. They won't come down in a storm in the Caribbean, right? So now you can build things for disaster recovery really quickly that won't go down in the next storm. All right, so we're really excited about what's going on with the industry and where this can go. There's probably a couple other 3D printed construction companies watching. Is there any room for collaboration or any communication you'd like to have with them? That's a great question. We actually started uh, at Black Buffalo last year. We started the first 3D construction printing global association. And we've called some of our peers throughout the industry to work with us on that so that we can collaborate in terms of what's right here, what works, what doesn't work, what are you seeing, what are we seeing? We would love to have collaboration. You know, it, it, this, is, this is literally the beginning of an industry that as this really quickly, this tide rises, we all go up, folks, right? So we, we, would, we want it. Uh, we've started an association to do that. We encourage everybody to please, let's get in touch. Cool. Um, what other things should we touch on, on like what you want to build or are you hiring? We are. We're in the process of hiring um, a couple mechanical engineers and material science uh, folks as we go in. We have a, a team of, of material, mechanical, production, um, uh, welding, et cetera, general labor. We have a team in Korea. We have a team in here. We have roughly about 20 to 25 people between the two teams. I think we're going to probably double that over the next year. So all those different specialty um, uh, trade, uh, we're looking for it right now. Um, we're right now in Elizabeth, New Jersey. We're very excited about it. We're also in good, uh, discussions of buying land and looking really uh, interesting. When, when we buy our own land, uh, probably here within the next few months, when we buy our own land, we're going to 3D print our factory. So it becomes our showcase. We're going to 3D print a residential community. So that becomes a showcase. 
you got a lot more coming from Black Buffalo in the next six to 12 months. We're really excited about it. What's the minimum crew? Today's you're experimenting, so yep. you have a few extra people on site. Yep. Uh, if you were running everything dialed in, how few people could you operate with? Four people. Um, four people is uh, the maximum that you really need. You need one running machine, right, in terms of the, the, uh, the nozzle going back, one running the pump, one on point, and then one watch, right, just one for safety. But I think that one for safety is probably going to become a moot point in the future as we do more smart technology on the printer for proximity alerts and, you know, uh, safety and security of the printer. So, yeah, we're three um, in the future, four right now. Going on, you talk about well, um, a lot of good stuff. Yeah, that was a lot. I really appreciate the time. You no, know, we're uh, you know we're just excited about the business. We have a lot going on, but you know, just like any uh, new technology, you know, part of the biggest need that this industry has is for companies like us and others to do as much R and D as possible to continue pushing the envelope in terms of the material and the engineering. We work with a company uh, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, on all of the gantry work right? Because this is a gantry tower. So we work with, with partners as well outside the box of construction where you're building gantries for concerts or, or, or uh, amusement parks at, at Disney, et cetera. Those are all gantries, right? What do they know that we don't know that we can make better on our machine in terms of the connections, the speed, the safety of this, the, 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 the pressure back and forth it can take or not take in terms of being able to move this faster? So we're constantly um, working on our R&D, sometimes to the detriment of revenue, right? I'd much rather, you know, make sure that we're building a great product and push something off a month or two because we just want to experiment a little more, just do a little bit more testing rather than bring it to market too quick and something goes wrong. So we're, we're really into R&D, making sure that everything that we do is perfect when it gets to you out in the field to be able to print your project. Solid. It seems like the cleanup process is almost complete. Yep. Uh, finishing up with the extruder um yep yep we're moving everything around now look it gets a little bit dusty when you're when you're cleaning up as well so we wear we wear masks a lot and make sure that you know everybody's uh safetyed up uh, uh on that but uh a little bit hot today but this show you i mean we're about a 90 degree day high humidity direct sun uh so it shows you you can even print uh pretty well um, in terms of uh, the, the weather. Um, we're also experimenting right now and possibly going into a project up in Alaska on um, you know, do, doing something on a permafrost. How can you 3D print on a permafrost, which would be just amazing for us to be able to uh, do those experiments as well. So we're looking forward to that. Um, there is a good question. How, or I guess this isn't really relevant to New Jersey, but have you done any seismic testing? Yes, uh, the seismic testing is done with MAPE um, um, in, in uh, their lab. And, uh, we are, so we are working on seismic testing right now. And once we get that uh, right concrete mixture, that admixture, which we actually are right there, um, we've gone through about, I might get the number wrong, but I'll be probably within three to five. We're in the mid 50s now this year of testing so many different admixtures just so that we get the right one for the right location and the right job. So we're going to have multiple different mixtures that are viable for different projects, depending on the project and the location. And all of those go through seismic, te seismic testing. Cool. Um, are there any things you take inspiration from? Like, I know Elon takes a lot of inspiration from Star Trek. I know his name <laughs> is the like mode. Yeah. So, yeah. Are there any, like, futuristic things you saw as a kid that now you feel like you're implementing in the world? Well, I'm a big Star Wars fan. Uh, so, of course, uh, anytime, and I grew up with Star Trek as well, just like uh, Elon Musk, uh, who, of course, has just done amazing things for our world. And we should all thank him for many of the things that, he did, that he's done and will continue to do. Um, inspiration for us in, on this was really um, a lot more of the need, not so much anything in the past, but for right now. Uh, we had multiple, we're the global accelerator for HNA. So there's many different products, services, and technologies that HN has. But this one, we decided to take first to the U.S. rather than something else uh, from Korea. The main reason is because we know globally there's so much need for housing. There's so much need to bring down the cost and the complexity and the time 
of being able to build a house or to build a factory or to build a, 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 a high rise, right? We wanted this one to be first because we thought it could take um, this technology and could make the most impact to the globe, not just for reducing everything that I mentioned, but also doing it sustainably so that we're, we're giving back to the environment. We're using renewable materials such as hemp in the future. Those type of things is what we're really focused on, building a great product, but also giving back as much as we can to the world. If a young engineer is deciding what major to do in college and they want to contribute to this technology, what areas need the most improvement? Material science. Uh, material science and mechanical engineering. Those are the two areas that we need most, um, you know, to be able to help us to think differently about the product, think differently about the output, think differently about the material, the ingredients that go into the material. Uh, young, fresh minds have a great view because they have so much fewer limitations than all of us older people that have been in the business too long and we start to get silos on. So we love